really intriguing. Uh, and part of the reason for that is diversity is something that, first of all, incredibly complicated when you really break it down. It's something that is difficult to do well and properly, but at the same time underlying it all, and there's been numerous studies that I'm going to talk about that sort of underline and emphasize this, it's incredibly important to individuals, to organizations, um, and getting into what, what makes diversity so complicated. The first step is even just defining like, what is a diverse organization? That could be looking at things like uh, race, it can be looking at gender, but there's a lot of other aspects too in terms of age, in terms of people with disabilities, in terms of people from different nationalities or socioeconomic backgrounds. We're going to focus more on race and gender today, mostly because that's where most of the academic research has been done. But these are all different things that impact what it means to be a diverse group or a diverse organization. The other thing that's complicated with diversity is the barriers that stop an organization from being diverse. I mean, obviously, there are such things such as direct discrimination, so people who are blatantly sexist or ageist or racist. But that's not really what we're going to discuss today. Really what I want to focus on is people and organizations that want and see the benefit of being diverse but don't necessarily understand why they aren't currently or how they can become diverse in the right way. Uh, and this often happens due to either unconscious bias, which is at the individual level, where either due to sim simple biases such as similar to me biases, like we went to the same school together, uh, you kind of look like me, we share a sense of humor, not necessarily factors that actually impact whether or not someone's going to be good at their job, but are things that can lead to confirmation bias and lead during an interview process for interviewers inadvertently to evaluate people in not the most subjective or most objective manner, I mean. The other thing about diversity that can be complicated is systematic discrimination. And this is when an organization's processes or policies are built in a way that either create or reinforce discrimination towards specific groups. And it can be really innocuous small things such as if you're asking a candidate in an interview, if you're asking them about their salary history versus their salary expectations, it seems like a really small, like just semantical difference. But if you're asking them about their salary history, then what you're doing is you're reinforcing any wage gap biases that pre-existed and you're basing their value that they're getting and what you're going to pay them, not on the value they're creating for your company by joining it, but by what someone else chose to pay them before. And that's why actually there are states in the United States that are starting to ban this question from the interview process because of the effects of systematic discrimination that it creates. Um, and the other thing about creating diverse workforces is it doesn't just start at the hiring phase, it starts at the education phase. So if you're trying to hire more female developers, but there are less women going into computer science, it naturally narrows the pool that you're pulling from anyway. So it makes that more difficult to create those diverse fears that you're trying to have. So like I said, pretty, pretty complicated. And it's also really difficult to do correctly. Um, like I said, this isn't talking about direct discrimination or people that you know, are trying to be malicious, but there's two major objections that I find people have when they're talking about the difficulty of diversity. One is that their company is too small to focus on that right now. It's not a priority to focus on right now. Uh, and they just really need to focus on being aligned. And I really want to emphasize the fact that coming from diverse backgrounds and having different ideas is not the same as not being aligned to company values or not wanting to create the same thing. I highly encourage all organizations to interview for and hire based on people who are aligned to your organizational values and want to accomplish the same things with the same enthusiasm that you do. But again, not using those biases of, oh, because someone comes from a different background, they are not going to be immediate aligned. Um, the other major objection I usually get is, oh, I just want to hire the best possible person, no matter what. And I agree. I 100% agree. And I think that's entirely what you should do. I'm not a huge fan of implementation of quotas or anything like that. But what good diversity practices do is it focuses on activities that happen at the beginning of the funnel. Do you really have the best candidate if maybe the best candidate never even applied for your position? Maybe they got filtered out for a reason that has nothing to do with their ability to do the job well. If you have these high funnel hiring procedures that are either being systematically discriminating against people or people are opting out because of the image that you're presenting, then that's another reason that you might not get the best person. 
um, as opposed to what you truly want, which is the best possible hire. Um, and really most importantly to me, at least, is diversity really, it is important. It's as simple as that, like both for the basic reason of it's the right thing to do, in my opinion, uh, but also it makes good business sense. It is fiscally responsible thing to do. Uh, it's not just something that's fluff. And there's, again, a ton of research to support this. McKinsey Institute in particular has done a lot of research on diversity. This particular study showed that gender diverse companies were 15% more likely to outperform their less gender diverse um, counterparts. <clears throat> and ethnically diverse companies were 35% more likely to outperform their homogenous counterparts. Um, even just going not just on overall performance, but like strict financial bottom line, which for finance people out there, EBITDA is really important, earnings before income and taxes. Uh, this shows across um, not just United Kingdom, United States, and Latin America, but uh, there's a big difference in terms of the most ethnically diverse organizations and the least ethnically diverse in terms just of earnings, in terms of pure fiscal responsibility and making that money. It is better, especially in multicultural countries such as the United States and Canada. The 61% versus 41%. Um, I actually have a ton more studies, but 10 minutes is not enough time to go through all of them. So if anyone's interested, I'd be happy to send you these slides later to take a look because there's so much research showing that diversity makes companies more innovative, makes them more profitable, and it can even add trillions of dollars to the global GDP. Uh, and some of the studies also that I looked at show not just that this does have an impact, but why it has an impact. And that kind of goes back to uh, that similar to me bias and that uncomfortableness that sometimes occurs when you're working with people who aren't exactly like you and don't necessarily think exactly like you. Those uh, studies that track diverse teams show that they're 58% more likely to predict stock prices, diverse juries were called more facts than non-diverse juries, and they are called them more correctly. Because when you are worried that someone might contradict you, then your brain actually pays more attention, it figures out those facts, and it makes you as an individual smarter as well as making the group smarter by having those different backgrounds and opinions. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of reasons that diversity is really good and really important. Uh, and so before I kind of dive in a little bit in terms of how you can do this, how you can make that happen for your own organizations, I wanted to share a little bit about um, what is happening at Granify. So Granify, we are a pretty small company, and I am the first person to admit we are not the most diverse company that exists by any stretch. Tech industry in general doesn't have a great reputation for this, um, but it is something over the past two years since I started at Granify that I think is very important. And so as I'm building and improving recruitment, hiring, and performance management processes, I'm really cognizant of what the research says about what we're doing and how that can impact different groups. Um, and it has shown some dividends. Uh, over the past three years. So this is a year-over-year -year analysis of diversity at Granify. So the first uh, bar being 2015, right before I started, 10% um, visible minorities, 17% women. Well, it's a slow increase. Like diversity changes can't happen overnight. Uh, they are slow to happen, but, and as we are a small organization, I really do want to preface this, as this is probably not statistically significant data, but it is trending in a way that makes me satisfied in a way that I'm going to keep measuring and monitoring this to make sure that's happening in the right direction. Um, the blue numbers, just for reference, uh, so 35% is the, according to last census, the amount of visible minorities in Edmonton, and then 51% is for women in Edmonton. So just to show you sort of, we're still behind on what we should be targeting for, but it is again trending in that right direction. Um, so yeah, in terms of strategies, and easy ways that you can make diversity make sense and put this research into use. So the first one is to have and showcase an inclusive culture. So this is examples of images from our old careers website. Um, these are actual pictures that we had up there and they are, they were good in the sense that they like, hey, we're a fun young company. But also when I look at these pictures, I think that it looks like you could also use these to describe a frat house. And that's not particularly the image that I wanted to project. Uh, we have a lot of people at Granify who are parents. Not everybody at Granify drinks, and even though obviously the whiskey on a foosball table, not exactly that same image. Um, you get the red solo cups. 
that sort of thing. So when we did and revamped our website uh, in August of this year, uh, one of the major things that uh, People Operations was looking at was how we showcase an inclusive culture. Because it is something I think we inherently do have. Um, so you wanted to show pictures of people like actually in working settings, uh, taking quotes from actual parents who work at Granify to show, hey, this is the kind of environment that we really are, and it is one that is diverse and inclusive. Again, this is so people don't self-select out of applying for Granify. Um, so the other thing, again, especially in terms of helping people not self-select out of your organization, is being really careful about the language you use in job posting. Now, job postings, a lot of times, you know, people will copy and paste from old ones or steal it from another thing, and that sort of just perpetuates, this is kind of what a job posting sounds like. Um, but there are a lot of tools you can look at because if a job, there's a lot of ways that job postings can be written either in a very um, masculine way with masculine encoded words versus female encoded words. Uh, there's a lot of tools you can look at. There's a service called Textio, which does a whole analysis and gives you a score. Uh, even if you don't use their service, if you go to the Textio website, you can look up your company and see how your job compares to other companies across the board. Um, there's also free services such as a gender decoder, which Kat Matfield has created in order to use artificial intelligence to analyze job postings for this very reason. Um, the other major thing with job postings, outside of just the language you're using to describe it, is looking at what requirements you put on the job. And are they actual requirements or are they nice to have, like when you actually end up hiring that person? Because there's been many studies that show that men are more likely to apply to a job even if they have at least 50% of the qualifications required for that position. Whereas women will wait until they have at least 100%, if not more, before applying so that they feel confident, like, this is what I need in order to succeed at that job. And that's why there's a lot of um, studies showing that that is women's advancement a lot slower because they're waiting until they have reached and achieved that level before moving on. Uh, and even though when you actually go through the hiring process, a lot of times hiring managers will end up saying, oh, well, yeah, that's just like a nice to have. I'll still accept them even though they're missing that one of that two things. So really being upfront and honest with yourselves and your hiring managers before writing that job description. Um, and then the last point was about structuring your interview process. So this is about however you structure it. There's a lot of different ways but having a structure so that each applicant for a different role goes through the same process is something that is really important because then you're comparing apples to apples. If two interviewers or two interviewees go through a process and get asked different questions, get different tasks, it's really hard to compare whether or not who would actually be the better candidate. And it also stops some of those unconscious biases from coming in because it's a predetermined structure for what they're going through. Um, we've actually set our process up so much so that this is a straight from our website so a candidate can go and can kind of get an idea of what the whole process of our interview looks like right away. Um, some of the other things in terms of when you're structuring your interviews is structuring who's part of that interview. And do you have uh, a diverse group of people in your panels in terms of not just um, gender or race but also like from different teams and different perspectives in terms of how they're going to fit into your organization as a whole to avoid individual biases. Um, so yeah, so these are just some of the ways in which over the past two years we've been implementing easy, cost-free things in order to improve the kind of inclusive culture and the inclusive views that we have and making sure that our recruitment process also recognizes and follows through with that as well. Uh, so yeah, that's it for me. Thanks. Do you guys have any questions? Um, so I'm going to ask you something really odd. Okay. Like, okay. Um, so you mentioned academic literature, so it seems mostly with the development of sociological literature uh, and research university. Yeah. And uh, so the comment uh, by the candidates is when they were particularly at the analytics meeting, mm -hmm. or meetup, uh, when you think of data and diversity, you're thinking about how you measure yeah. diversity. Yeah. So there is a literature in both biology and economics on diversity measures. So I'm wondering if you look 
into some of that. And one of the advantages of this is that these measures are programmed up in our packages, for example. So you can just grab them and do your analysis that way. Yeah, so first of all, they're, they're not just uh, the two slides I showed were from McKinsey, um, but there is a lot of the things I referenced in the footnotes are from uh, the Journal of Psychology and from a academic papers as well. They just, academic papers tend not to have pretty graphs that I can steal very easily. Um, and the other reason that I prefer to use either the academic papers or um, the McKinsey Institute as opposed to me doing my own analysis, like I've taken statistics class, but also taking raw data and then pulling information from that isn't my specialty and it's more likely or not that I can try and find things to confirm whatever bias I may have as opposed to allowing people who are doing this research and then taking their results. Um, I do know that there are like a lot of that information that exists that I looked through when I was in university. Um, but for the most part, when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at published studies as opposed to doing the R data yeah, reflection myself. The sociologists myself. aren't reading the target diversity. Pardon? The sociologists that I think you're reading aren't reading the target diversity. If you'd like, I can send you which studies I was looking at, because it's not just sociology, but I'd be happy to share that with you. I have links to all of them. Okay. Any other questions? Cool. All right, thanks very much. Yeah. Our final contestant is Nathan Beck from Hendricks. You may not have heard of Hendricks unless you're at the launch party here a few weeks back. Uh, he's going to talk about artificial intelligence to help improve the meetings. How many of you want to put your meetings with artificial intelligence? Because we know the real intelligence. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, uh, my name is Nathan Beck. Uh, I'm the product manager for Testfire Labs, just across the hall there. Uh, and I'm going to be chatting about how we're going to use uh, analytics to improve workplace productivity. Uh, so that's a pretty broad topic. So I'm just going to kind of chat about where we came from and how we narrowed down that scope to focus around meetings. Uh, so Testfire was uh, founded uh, in March 2017 by uh, Dave Damer. Uh, he's uh, uh, a local Edmontonian and I'm <laughs> yeah, right there. <laughs> uh, a lifelong uh, Edmontonian entrepreneur. Uh, this is actually his uh, uh, third startup. Uh, and a lot of the ideas that came from Testfire came from his uh, past experience uh, as CEO of uh, ThinkTel, where he worked for the last 14 years. Um, a lot of the problems that he saw came from uh, uh, working and building uh, 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 productivity and collaboration tools uh, with companies across Canada. And so where Testfire came, or, or the goal of Testfire that he kind of came up with is uh, we want to build solutions to help people do the best work in a busy and complicated world. Uh, so the problem with that is there's you know tons of daily interactions. They're at an all-time high. Uh, in the 60s, we had um, 1,000 interactions per year in the workplace, and now we have over 30,000 interactions per year. Um, and when it comes to productivity, um, the employee is seen as uh, somebody who has to wear multiple hats now, um, managing multiple products. But um, one of the areas that we kind of narrowed it down to that really needed a lot of work was in meetings. And I think we can all agree that the number one time waster in the office is we have too many meetings. Uh, professionals attend a total of 61 meetings per month. Um, and over half of that time spent in meetings is considered uh, unproductive or a waste of time. Um, and I'm sure we've all experienced this where you're sitting around the room and you're looking at, gee, I wonder how much money um, our company is spending on this meeting. Well, we had a meeting with multiple managers and executives. You could be looking at over $1,000 per hour just to talk about a status update. And so this is kind of where we introduced Hendrix. Uh, we wanted Hendrix to act as a tool that can, um, using natural language and, and um, machine learning processing, machine learning processing, um, fuck. <laughs> um, anyways, so we, we kind of wanted to focus on uh, three areas with, with Hendrix that we could uh, improve meetings. Uh, that was restoring employee engagement uh, improve meeting effectiveness and, and seeing progress in a new way. Uh, when it came to restoring employee engagement, uh, what we wanted to do was kind of create a platform where that would help people pay more attention, less laptops, less less phones. Uh, uh, so Hendrix can uh, you invite him to a meeting and he'll take meeting notes for you. Uh, 
capture the key topics uh, and action items from that meeting, or you can you know call out and say Hendrix take an action item, assign it to Eric for Friday, and he'll be able to capture that. And our goal with that was to hopefully improve productivity in uh, a meeting where people are paying more attention. Uh, when it comes to improving meeting effectiveness, uh, we wanted Hendrix to be able to look for objectives, track meeting metrics, and email a meeting summary to your team. Uh, so for example, if you're able to upload an agenda to your meeting beforehand, you could be able to use Hendrix to track what is happening, what you plan to happen with that agenda, and follow that along through the meeting and track that at the end to see if, if you were able to actually stay productive in the meeting. And the third one is kind of seeing progress in a new way. So, so this is uh, where we take all of the data from those meeting summaries and we pull them together into uh, an analytics or a dashboard platform. And this is kind of uh, the cool part that you don't really see in meeting platforms that you have today or, or note-taking platforms. We're able to take uh, the topics and the discussions that happen over uh, five to 10 meetings in the past week and or man month or year and show that into a dashboard that says this is what your company has been talking about for the last Week and a half. Or if you want to uh, look at your meeting minutes, how much time is every individual sp spending on uh, uh, in a meeting uh, per week, uh, things like that. So uh, here I kind of have a sample of what a summary is going to look like, and or what, what it does look like. And as you can see, you have uh, issues discussed, uh, the type of meeting that you had, decisions made, tasks assigned, the call details such as uh, how long, uh, it, when was it supposed to actually start, did it start, on time, how long did it last, who participated in the meeting, was there a meeting wrap-up? Uh, stats like this are what we think are going to be valuable to improving meeting productivity. But not just having the notes, or just having the notes isn't what makes the meeting more productive. This is just kind of like the first step. It's what you do with that, aggregate it into a dashboard that is kind of where we see the most value in that. So now you could take your meetings. If you're an individual, you can look at your meeting trends from the past meeting. If you're a team leader, you can look at your meeting trends and you could say, this is what my team has been talking about. They've been talking about uh, update status, technology, computing, problem solving, hockey, weather, you know that. If you're a CEO, you could take a look at uh, how many meetings is my team spending per week? What is the average meeting length? And that, those are cool high level stats you could just take a look at and see, you know, where is my team at? How much time are we spending? Uh, and then the next step with that and kind of where we're headed is not only like, it's cool to have stats that you can look at and information you can look at, but being able to take action items to really improve the productivity of your meetings is where you want to take that. And sorry for the mock-up dashboard, we haven't quite gotten this far yet, but what we want to do with these meeting stats is be able to say, look at the meetings and say, you close out the most action items when your meeting count is in the five to 10 range. So if you're not able to complete all of your action items for the week, maybe it's because you're spending too much time in meetings, or if you are actually, uh, uh, completing your action items, try to keep your meetings within the five to 10 range so that you're not overwhelming yourself or something like that. Or maybe you have a recurring meeting that is constantly getting canceled. Uh, if you're uh, always canceling your recurring meetings, then you should probably not have them as recurring meetings because you're blocking off that time in your calendar and you're blocking off that time, you're not gonna make time to do actual work. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're hoping to go with, with Hendrix and uh, yeah, so, so we got, we've got the beta going right now. Uh, with the beta, you can actually invite Hendrix to a meeting through your cell phone or through Google Hangouts or through Skype, and he'll record your meeting and send you one of those summaries. And then in the next six weeks here, we're actually hoping to get that dashboard uh, up and running for people to start getting that feedback. So, yeah, any questions? Are you going to have Slack integration? I'm hoping we'll have Slack integration. Yeah, Slack's got those uh, meeting meeting now, right now, in the box and stuff like that, so it'd be cool. So if I'm following, is it primarily recording the, uh, the sound of the audio meeting, or is it also recording the meeting itself? Yeah. And that will match track to the analytics and reports? Yeah, so um, you invite Andrew to the meeting, he records the audio, and live while he was recording that audio, uses natural language processing to transcribe that to text. And then in that text, he actually takes the most important bits of information from the summary and, or from the conversation and puts it into a point form summary for you to look at afterwards. And then with all that, he's also looking at what are the topics being talked about, putting that into a section that you could say, these are the topics that we talked about. 
And then we take that data, aggregate it, and put it into a dashboard. Is it the intent that over time the multiple match and then Dave's list and getting busted up in the Yeah, that's that's the goal is like we want to use modern meeting methodology to try to figure out what is the best type of meeting and what is the best use of meetings so that meetings become more productive. So it's going to be like, um, uh, are you spending 30 hours a week in a meeting? We should reduce that a little bit. Um, what, also, what, like, what are the types of meetings, right? So if it's a status update meeting, making sure that you're staying on point uh, with updating status and that the conversation trends don't fall off track. So with Ethan first 10 minutes of the meeting talking about the orders came, let me have a little summary of the others game <laughs> in that uh, discussion. Or? Uh, you could, yeah. But <laughs> does it have some way to filter the relevant uh, yeah, we can. So one of the ways that we've just said is like if you just haven't started the meeting yet, uh, you invite Hendrix to the call, but then you say Hendrix start the meeting, and that's when Hendrix actually begins recording the meeting. So if you haven't started the meeting yet and you're just talking about whatever, he won't be recording that. And it's when you actually interact with them and say start the meeting that he begins recording. Yeah. So um, oh. okay. Yeah. Uh, where did the Northwest? We have an incredibly diverse. Uh, workforce, and um, I'm just wondering how Hendrix deals with uh, the number of uh, natural accents, as well as the fact that we sometimes have interpreters and dates for uh, like ASL, which has a slightly different grammatical structure. Uh, we struggle a little bit with accents. <laughs> it's definitely a work in progress. So. Um, our speech to text accuracy right now is sitting get up to 75 percent on the speech to text accuracy, just on like regular proper English, and so if you start throwing in accents, it makes it more difficult. When you have a lot of reverb in a room or lots of noise, it makes it more difficult for him. We have a confidence rating uh, that actually tells you how accurate he thinks his text is going to be, but it's definitely, um, as we go on and train and get more meeting hours in, um, you have to train each different scenarios with a specific uh, reverb in a room or a specific size of a meeting room or a specific accent. The more hours that you get using Hendrix with that scenario, the better he gets and improves over time. And that's the machine learning aspect of it. You raised about the modeling side of it and what you know, the AI. How do you navigate the applying models to what might or might not be proprietary for different participants in the company? You know, assume that your models are running from everybody's. Are you talking in terms of building up the the actual internal corpus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the way that you want to do an online is that you're Yeah, that's actually because of the summarization that makes it a little bit easier. But uh, there's like a, a pyramid built for each organization. This is really targeted at, at enterprise companies, right? Where there's some customization that's going to happen. So the corpus that builds up the speech to text uh, lexicon for that company is based on a regional set, an industry set. A department set like HR and finance operations all have their own kind of dialogue and words that they use. And then there's an individual corpus that includes all the people that you interact with, their names, uh, specific terms, <coughs> phrases that you use, and the individual so it builds up to the individual user. So that's not generic, it's got generic across it. That's one of the big differences people walk in with like, how is this different than Alexa or yeah. Google Home or whatever? And like, this is this is tailored to the end user. And very business focused. So basic pretty model across everything and more than one more percent time goes on. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, and why Hendrix? And other drugs considered? It was a uh, uh, hundred names considered and a marketing uh, intern sitting in a room for two days running through a checklist and determining uh, domain domain availability, <laughs> text engine, essentially disaggregated so in the case it's a really Jimmy and Jen. Uh, so we'll Thanks. Hey, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you guys had any concerns about, like, if you guys are selling primarily to enterprise and, you know, I know you guys have some really awesome government contracts or how it's come out. Um, has there been any concerns around confidentiality since you're recording all their all the meetings and, and summarizing them? Like, how are you guys handling that? Yeah, that's like our number one question from everybody. <laughs> how do you deal with the confidential information? 
Um, so we don't store any of the recordings. We keep a couple just for like training purposes, but our idea is not to have direct transcripts and direct recordings that you can reference unless you wanted to. The idea is just to have the summary. So any of our recordings, they get processed through the, the text-to-speech, get deleted within seven days. Um, they are, like, while in the seven days, they're stored on, like, the Azure cloud, which is all 256-bit encrypted, and it's quite secure, stored on servers in Canada. And then the speech-to-text is uh, only an email, so it's as secure as somebody's email, right? Uh, and that, that's about, that's how generally how we address it, so. Yeah. Cool. Is Hendrix listening right now? No, Hendrix isn't listening. <laughs> I didn't. He's always listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, from kind of a due diligence perspective, like recording meetings, conversations, and then perhaps narrowing the scope of what you're drilling down into, uh, kind of piercing confidentiality, if you will, in order to be able to suss out information or determine if you need to investigate further or something like that. Is that something that a tool like this lends itself to ultimately? Is that something that you would ultimately be able to do? Are you actually like kind of effectively marking up these meetings as you, as at like basically the, the audio of these meetings that uh, that might also find other applications and stuff like this? Is that something that you do? Uh, yeah, I think I'm not quite sure I quite understand the question now. It's... Well, I guess I'm okay. So, you're analyzing what people are saying in these meetings yeah. um, for the purposes of ensuring uh, efficiency. Um, you might also be able to use that for other purposes as well. For example, I'm thinking in terms of if you want to demonstrate that uh, uh, you're on the up and up as regards to what you're discussing in these meetings, yeah. but you also want to protect people's confidentiality. Like that's kind of tricky, right? You either yeah. open it up or you don't. Yeah. With this, you might be able to do a little bit more surgical. Yeah, I, yeah, that could be that'll end up being one of the challenges, and I think uh, that's definitely come up in some conversation before, where it's just like um, if you're a team leader and you use Hendrix, but your team members don't want you to know what they're saying in every single meeting, how do you manage that? And uh, yeah, but uh, you know, yeah, sorry. I'm wondering if you have reasons to why it's efficient and organization and if it's supervised how to get the labels. Uh, like to go from that directly. What kind of machine learning do we <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there are developers. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the machine learning like the natural language processing aspect, we're actually leveraging the IBM Watson stack. So we haven't actually directly done any of that information ourselves. Uh, and the, the summarization algorithm that we've written so far uh, isn't really machine learning based at all. Uh, so we're, we're leveraging some of the Watson uh, natural language to assemble sort of a list of categories and things that were discussed. And then we're, I don't want to spill the secret sauce too much, but <laughs> essentially we're, we're looking for similarity between, between utterances in your, your transcripts. And then something that is more similar to the surrounding utterances is sort of there's a ranking that happens. So if you're if you're imagine you have a paragraph of text that talks about meetings in natural language, the sentence that has the most references to meetings in natural language in that paragraph would be ranked the highest and become your your summarizing statement. But we're not rewriting the the, the transcript at all. So you use some external tool like Argon Watson for generating the summarization, but you don't do any tool more evaluation. Because I suppose that there is still some form where you do have to you know, label it. Yeah, it's sort of a mix of those two things. And like, yeah, the, the, the Watson is providing a lot of the metadata that we're using to, to generate our summaries. We're still generating the summaries ourselves, but it's sort of like a layer built on top of machine learning that's not machine learning itself. That makes sense. And, and one day maybe we'll get there, but it's sort of like a, a build an inexpensive algorithm and gets us there faster and then improve on it over time. That's one more question. Do you guys use Hendrix in your meetings? 
Keep trying to. Whenever we remember to bring them in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's actually our meetings are one of the best places to test them out because we know what the structure of our meetings was supposed to be and what was being said, and we know the context of the meeting. So being you able to see. Confused when you talk about him instead of him. Yeah, we had to get him. To, we had to get him to stop. We say, what do we say? We just say he who wants not be named, or we try not. <laughs> we just say him whenever we talk about him. So yeah. <laughs> Forget the last two. Uh, next month is a surprise. It's either the 13th or the 20th, and it could be on any time. So if you'd like to sponsor a surprise, please contact me. And if you want to speak at it, also talk to us. What's that? It's like the 20th.